So tonight we're back on this healthy tools. So I said in the very first talk in this series that if a person's going to deal with their addiction and their complex trauma, basically you got to get healthy. So two part or three parts to getting healthy. The first is self-awareness, and that's understanding all the unhealthy ways I act and the patterns of unhealthy that are taking place in my life and starting to be aware of that. And then secondly, I have to learn what healthy looks like. And thirdly, I got to learn tools to get to healthy. And so that's what this series is about. And tonight, we're coming to the topic of money. And what I'm really focusing on is how do we meet the needs that we have in healthy ways. And the last two weeks, we talked about how do we meet the need for food and pleasure. And in order to get food and sometimes to get pleasure, you got to spend money. So money isn't not actually a first need, but it's a need in order to get some needs met. And money is a huge issue. And so I want to break it down three different ways. First is money in general for people, no matter how healthy they are, is a challenge. Money is this thing that's just a necessary part of life. You can't live without it, but it is very tricky to manage. It might seem like it's kind of an insignificant thing, but you begin to realize that it is connected to just about everything we do, and we can go wrong with money in a thousand different directions. And the number one, or number one cause of conflict, the studies say in marriages today, is money. So it causes all kinds of issues. So money is very easy to misuse. And it's also very easy to develop the wrong attitude toward no matter who you are. What I have learned over the years is if I want to know the priorities of a person, watch what they spend their money on. So money reveals a lot about you and what's important to you. So that's just in general. So money is a challenge for everybody. But it's an even greater challenge for people in recovery. And I got quite a long list. And some of you will relate to every single one of the points that I'm going to make. But the first major issue around money in recovery is that money can be a trigger to you. And what I have seen over years in working with people in recovery is that for some people, that very first payday, once they're in recovery, also becomes relapse day. Because they get that first paycheck and their brain goes to, boy, let's party. The second thing that can happen with people is just even having money in your pocket is a trigger. I know some addicts who when they get their paycheck, they spend it all just to get rid of the money so they're not going to be tempted. They don't have any money left for groceries, but they spend it all and the temptation is gone. And so money can be a huge trigger, especially when you begin to look at meth being sold for less money. Um, and, and so even having a little bit of money can be a problem. But not just having money can be a trigger, not having money can also be a trigger for some people. And so if you don't have money, it can be a trigger to start your boosting career up again and getting some money or do uh, a few bit of dealing, deal some drugs, get some quick money, or turn a couple tricks and get some fast money. And so not having money can be a trigger. And then for some people... Having a credit card or a debit card is just too big of a trigger. It is something that they cannot handle. So if you're in recovery, you probably relate to some degree to that. And then on top of that is gambling addiction, shopping addiction, and all of that is money related. Now let's say you get in a relationship, then you have money becomes this cause or source of conflict, but also stress. I don't know many people coming into recovery out of addiction who don't have debts. They don't have a huge saving account. That's all been gone. 
they got a lot of debt. And debt adds a lot of stress to life. Then, for many people coming in out of complex trauma, your brain is still instant gratification. And so, part of what you've done in your life is just make lots of impulsive decisions. So you buy stuff before you've thought about it. Just because you feel like buying it in that second of time. And so, impulsive decisions can mean coming home with a new TV and laptop, but then the stress that comes up after that and the conflict that comes after that is great. And then some people get in a relationship and they spend a whole bunch of money and they come home and they didn't ask the other person if it was okay to go and spend $500. They just did it and now they've got a huge conflict. I have found that the majority of people in recovery would brand themselves as poor money managers. There's some that manage money well, but those are the exception. Most have not learned how to manage their money, and so they tend to waste money and then struggle to pay bills. All of that adds stress and creates conflict. Some who come out of complex trauma have hoarding issues. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but that is tied in with the money thing, and that can become a source of great conflict, not just with a partner, but with family and friends as well. And then many people that come out of complex trauma, even poverty and addiction, can have a very distorted view of success and they can come into recovery thinking that if I just get enough money to buy what I want then I'll be happy so their definition of happiness and success is tied into getting lots of money and they set themselves up for disappointment I also have encountered many clients who grow up in a family where parents have defined success by the possessions you own, the house you live in. And so the child still gets pressure from the parent to have certain things to prove that they're successful. And the parent wants the child to have it because that child is an embarrassment to the parent if they don't have it. So they get lots of pressure and our culture gives us the same message. I have also found that many clients coming out of complex trauma and poverty often look at people with lots of money and because they wear a smile in public, they think those are happy people. And then they're envious of them. And they walk around saying, if I just had what they had, then I would be happy. And I often say, do you know anything about their private life? Because just because they wear a smile doesn't mean they're happy. But that is what can easily happen. And so one of the things that's really important to understand up front is this. Money is a big part of what is necessary to meet needs. And so what is very easy to think is that more money is the solution to my problems. I hope you know that that's a lie. That just having external things does not make me a happy person. That happens from a healthy internal life, not from more things. Okay, now it's really hard for people in addiction to manage money when they come into recovery. But let me take it to the third level, and that's the challenges for people with complex trauma. And there's two main areas I want to focus on, and then I'll add a couple extra after that. If you come from complex trauma, life for most people in complex trauma is unstable. You're not sure what mood dad's going to be in today, so that is iffy all the time. You walk on eggshells. Some of you don't know if you're going to have food to eat on any given day because mom and dad spend it all on drugs and alcohol. So there's lots of fighting that makes life unstable. Parents aren't consistent. They're not a rock. 
And so your life is marked by instability. And that is what creates some of the trauma. Because you feel like a little child all alone facing all of this instability and you don't feel strong enough to handle it. So you're traumatized by it. What is easy for people to do as they get older is think that if I have lots of money in the bank, then that will be what gives me stability. That is a lie. But it is really easy to think that because if you got lots of money in the bank, then you think I can handle anything that comes up that might make my life unstable. But again, it's looking for stability in external only. And that will let you down. And so many people begin to think, especially in our culture, that if I want a safe and stable and secure future, I need to squirrel all my money away so that I'm prepared. Now, it's wise to be prepared financially for the future if you can, but that shouldn't be the main source of stability. Now, what can happen also if a person thinks that way is they begin to then think, I need lots of money or my future is insecure, so I better be a workaholic. And then they work and work and they lose their kids, they lose their marriage, because money now is in control of their life. And that is a very dangerous thing. So be careful and be aware if you find yourself looking for, to money to fill that security need. It will disappoint you. Second one, and this is probably the biggest one, is to see Money and shame, money and my sense of value. So what happens in complex trauma is you end up with this thing called shame. So you feel the reason I was neglected and abandoned and abused is I'm bad. Something's wrong with me. I'm not good enough. And so you develop a core belief that says I'm not good enough. I'm not valuable. So what can then happen is a whole bunch of things that will intersect with money. So first one, some of you with lots of shame, just the fact that you're poor today feeds your shame and triggers your shame and seems to prove to you that you're not good enough because you're still poor. So be aware of that one. Um, some of you are on EIA and you have to be on EIA, but your family is embarrassed that you're not working for a living. And so that can become a source of shame if you're on EIA. And some of you might then want to get a job, but you can't because of mental health limitations because you need to work on getting a solid recovery in place. But your family keeps saying, why aren't you working yet? You should be a responsible parent, and you're not. And they feed your shame. So be aware of those things. I have had many clients say, I got to quit recovery, quit treatment, and go back to work. Because I got to prove that I'm the provider for my family. And I say, I don't see this turning out well. But they feel that pressure, and it's shame-driven. Okay? Next thing. If you grew up with lots of shame and you figured everybody looked down on you and nobody respected you because, after all, they didn't respect you at home, boy, if you had money, people all of a sudden respected you. And so now you're thinking, money is what gains me respect. Secondly, if you grew up with lots of shame, then you didn't feel like you fit in anywhere. You never belonged. You felt all alone in a crowd. And then as soon as you had lots of money, man, you had friends coming out of your ears. Everybody wanted to be your friend. You all of a sudden fit in. And you go, wow, money helps me belong. And you get that message into your brain. Another part of shame is you feel like a total failure. But now when you got money, that proves you're not a failure. It proves you're a success. 
And so now you see money as a solution to feeling like a failure, to proving that you're a success. And then part of shame is I have to wear a mask because if people get to know the real me, they will reject me like everybody else has. And so money enables you to establish an image that people like and people respect. And so again, it seems to make or become the solution to your problems. And the final shame one, shame makes me feel inferior. But if I have lots of money, I feel superior to everybody else. So for people coming from complex trauma, my point is, it creates, because of shame, all kinds of ways to have the wrong relationship with money and to believe lies about money. And that's what I want you to be aware of. Okay, third thing that happens with complex trauma, you feel this constant emotional emptiness and pain. And guess what money lets you do? Buy medication. You can buy drugs, alcohol, and activities and have endless distractions that take you out of the pain and give you some pleasure. And so again, people can think, money is the solution to my pain, and money is solution to my emptiness. And then, whenever you're discontented, money buys you stuff to do. Money gives you that high for a little while, and it seems to feel, fill the emptiness inside of you. Now be aware of another part of complex trauma, and that is you created complex trauma in your kids, most likely. And what happens with that is you carry this guilt. And what can happen if you are struggling to pay the bills, you feel extra guilty that you can't get your kids lots of gifts. And so I have seen many people go into debt further because their guilt at not giving their kids all the nice things of our culture has driven them to a very bad decision. And then that can add a whole bunch of stress later. So do you see that? All of those things that have developed there coming out of complex trauma is distorted perspectives on money. And those distorted perspectives on money can result in having the wrong attitude toward money. And that's what I want you to think about right now. So understand up front, money is not a bad thing. Money is neutral. I hear clients say sometimes, money is the root of all evil. And I say, you haven't read your Bible, if that's what you think. The Bible says the love of money is the root of evil. Not anything wrong with money, it's my attitude toward money. That's the issue. And so that's what I want you to understand, is it's really easy to have the wrong attitude toward money. Especially in the culture we live in, especially because of the complex trauma distortions. And so what happens though, is if I develop the wrong attitude toward money, Money becomes like a drug. It seems to solve my problems, but it only makes it worse. Exactly like a drug. And so money is something that you can easily become addicted. So the wrong attitude toward money is called greed. And I want to talk about that. Greed is wanting more money, living to get more money, thinking that having more money will make me happy, and will meet all of my needs. Now, some of people have said to me over the years, I don't have greed after all, I'm poor. And I go, okay, let's just see if we can figure out how do we tell if we have greed. You realize that some of the wealthiest people in the world are super greedy, and some of the poorest people in the world are just as greedy. They just haven't had the opportunity. It doesn't mean they don't have the attitude. So what are some of the ind indicators? Now, this is tricky, okay? So what I'm going to do is give you different things that could be indicators, 
but they aren't necessarily indicators. So, a workaholic. That could definitely be greed. Somebody saying, I need more, I need more, I need more. But that could also be somebody that just says, I've got lots of children and I have to pay the bills and I've got to be a responsible adult, so I've got to work extra hours as much as possible. So that could be a good thing. Okay, then you go to the other extreme, a cheapskate. So some of you, I used to say about my grandma that she was so cheap that when she opened her wallet to get a bill out, the queen blinked. Because <laughs> it hadn't seen the light for a long time. In case you didn't get that joke. Okay. <clears throat> so a cheapskate could be somebody that just manages their money very well. And they're very careful not to waste money, to save money. And some people can look at them and go, what a cheapskate. Other people who are a cheapskate are driven by greed. I'm not going to spend a penny on you because I want it for me to create wealth. So that can be a greed. A hoarder. A hoarder can be greed. But do you realize that hoarding, in the, for the most part, comes out of complex trauma? It is a person who's gone through abandonment. And so part of their brain is finding a solution so they think to abandonment is just to collect things so they won't get abandoned by things. They can't let go of stuff. So it, hoarding could be greed, but it could be deep abandonment issues. Next one, a person who's in debt. That could be greed. They want something so badly they spend it even though they don't have the money. Or it could be somebody that just made some bad decisions earlier in life and now they're living with the consequences. So again, you have to sort that out. Theft, it could be greed. But I suspect there's some of you who theft gave you a high. There was the rush. And that was the addiction. And so that wasn't necessarily greed. That was a totally different motivation behind theft. Now, I have some people say to me, I give lots of money to people. How could I be greedy? And I go, well, you're a multimillionaire. And so for you to give $1,000, that's not really generous in light of how much money you have. So you, I don't see you making any big sacrifices to give. I see you just giving out of your surplus. So you could still be very greedy even though you're giving. So those are just some indicators in case you wanted to check if you're greedy or not. If you are, here's the results. You want to know that greedy people always end up with resentments? Because the world's giving them a bad deal because all this money's not satisfying them and people aren't cooperating with their program and so they're mad at everybody. And then they have lots of fights in their relationship. And you want to know one of the main indicators of greed? And the consequences is you worry all the time about money. It's constantly an obsession. So what can happen with greed is that you start out and you go, money is going to serve me. But over time, you now serve money. And money is the boss of your life. Now here's the saddest part of greed. I could take you to somebody where their dad told them that he loved them all the time, and their dad did many nice things for them, but their dad loved money more than them. And at some point in the child's life, they realize, dad loves me as long as it doesn't interfere with his money. And then the money becomes more important than me. You know how much that hurts a child when they realize dad loves his car more than me? Dad loves getting money more than me? That is devastating. And so when you are greedy, at some point in a relationship, your greed will trump loving other people. And your greed will come before loving them. And it will do a lot of damage. Oops, so let's go to how do we learn to manage money, have a healthy relationship with money. Again, this is one of the things in our culture that 
Our culture teaches an awful lot about, so I'm not going to go through a lengthy thing. You can go to budgeting classes, etc. There's lots of different stuff out there to help you. But do learn money management. And so when you manage money, there's three things really. Saving, spending, and giving. Okay? So that's three different areas for money. And then what I find with many people is distinguish between a need and a want. I used to do a thing with clients where I gave them a list of things and I put need, want, and they were to check which was a need and which was a want. And some people, everything was a need. A 55-inch television, need. Um, and, and just keep on going down, need, need, need. And they did not know how to distinguish between a need and a want. And that becomes very important in figuring out how to money, manage money well. Secondly, work at a budget. Get somebody to help you. I used to do an exercise with clients where they would take how much money they got every week, two weeks, whatever, and then they would have to go through every expense they had. Cigarettes, food, all the different things. Do you want to know where most money went that they didn't even realize? Eating out. Coffee. And all of a sudden they began to realize, wow, I can't believe how much money I'm spending here. And so if you do that, that becomes a very important thing. Okay, now I've seen people that have made the best budgets in, a wor in the world and never followed them. So you need to develop a self-control. And basically... When Kim and I got married, we said this to each other, we are going to live within our means. We're going to figure out a way to live within our means so that we don't spend more than we make. And we were able to do that. And it's possible, it takes work, but you can do that. Next one, if you start to get money coming in, then you have to begin to think about saving and planning. And so that, for some of you, you're not even close to that. That's fine. But for those of you that are, give that some thought. But here's the key thing. If greed's the wrong attitude towards money, what's the right attitude? It's contentment. Contentment with what I have. Doesn't mean it'd be nice to have this, but I am not going to sacrifice the important things of my life to get this and hurt those things. I am content with what I have where I'm at. And so learning contentment is a really th key thing, and we're going to talk about that further in this series. Final thing, many people in early recovery can't have a credit card or a debit card. Give that some thought. If you are beginning to realize that is tripping you up repeatedly, begin to look at cutting them up or giving them to somebody else so that it's not a temptation. So, I hope this helps. Some of you, when I mentioned that we're going to be talking about money, I got all this, oh, money, it's such a problem area in my life. I hope you see that it's an important area to get under control and to learn to be healthy in. Okay, it's the Christian part, and we've been going through, or started, looking at what I consider to be the best example in the Bible of complex trauma, and it's when Israel, the people of Israel, about three million come out of slavery, and they had spent generations being slaves, mistreated, etc., by the Egyptian people. So when they come out of that slavery... All of a sudden, you see these people that have all the 60 characteristics of complex trauma that we talk about. So I thought I would take you through this series to show you kind of how messed up they were so that you would begin to see yourself and see kind of how God responded to all of their complex trauma. So what we did last week is I talked about the very first thing God did. So I picture God as this perfect therapist, counselor, 
And so I'm sitting there going, what's the first thing he did in the very first session with these new clients that he's got who have severe complex trauma? And so we said last week that a person with complex trauma is not going to heal unless they learn to trust. But the problem is people who have lived all their life not trusting, well, that's the last thing they want to do is trust. And so trust becomes something they need, but they resist. And so God forces them into situations where they see how he faithfully provides for them, even though they don't want to be in those positions. And he, fa- he takes them to things where they see his power, his commitment, his faithfulness, his love. All of those are very necessary. So then I go, okay, what's the second thing God wants them to see? And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So here's what I, if you want to read, starting in Exodus 13, what you're going to find is the, the writer only picks certain scenes. There are thousands of different things happening, but he just picks one here, one here, one here. And I go, why did he pick those particular events? And as I think about it, I think he's wanting us to show what God had to do in what order to bring about healing in traumatized people. So what's the second thing that God's going to do? He's going to show them how sick they are. Guess what I do when people come to react and finding freedom? Show you how screwed up you are and you all love me for it. Another way to look at that. Step one, if you're going to get healthy, you got to get to know God so you can trust Him. Step two, if you're going to get to healthy, you got to get to know yourself. And so, people are not going to change unless they know they're sick. How many of you have either said this or talked to somebody, and somebody has said to you or to somebody else, you should go to React, and they go, I don't need React. And everybody's looking at them going, what? You don't know how badly you need React. And they go, no, I don't need React. And so how are they going to ever go to React when they see how sick they are? So God is going to do the next event to help them see how sick they are. Now, again, I want to say this up front. This is not something we all get in line and clap for God that he's showing us how sick we are. We like it when God shows us good things about ourselves, but when we get presented with an accurate picture that shows our ugliness, for most of us it takes us to shame or we just don't want to go there. It's too painful, brings up too much stuff. But what God is saying is, I'm not taking you there to leave you there as if pain all by itself was a good thing. I'm taking you there because that has to be the place you begin if you're ever going to change. So we're not going to stay there. We're going to go there, get an accurate picture, and that's going to create a hunger and a motivation to change. And so that's what God's going to do. So let me read you what happened. Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea. So remember last week they went through the Red Sea and they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in the desert for three days without finding any water. Now, again, what you have to understand is a couple of things. There are about three million people, but we're also told that they brought sheep, cattle, and goats. So you can imagine that they brought water with them as they left Egypt. They brought enough water to get them through a couple days. But do you imagine how much water you would need to carry with you to feed a couple sheep and cows and your family? A lot of water. So they would run out very quickly. So it says, when they came to the oasis of Merah. So you can imagine three days, they are thirsty, they are parched. And they see an oasis, they see palm trees and greenery, and they're going, water, we can't wait to get there. And they all go running, 
but they found that the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. So here's where you're going to get your first picture of complex trauma. So they got their hopes up. We're going to have water. We're really thirsty. We're starting to get frustrated that there's been no water. We found water, and it's, and it's bitter. What would a good complex trauma person do at that point? Well, here's what they did. They complained, and they turned against Moses. They blamed the leader for what was going on. And what are we going to drink, they demanded. So they are lashing out. They are angry. And you can imagine the noise, the drama, as all these frustrated people are getting up from getting a drink of this bitter water, and they're mad, they're disappointed. And so Moses cries out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Now what's a complex trauma person going to do when Moses comes walking along with, here's a solution to our problem, and throws a piece of wood in the water? You're going to get more mad at him. But Moses threw it in the water, and this made the water good to drink. Sometimes the solutions we're looking for come from what seems like dumb, dumb things. And it takes humility and trust to begin to trust some of that. So it was there at Merah that the Lord set before them the following decree or law. He said, If you will do what is right in God's sight, obeying his commands, keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. And so Jehovah Nissi, or Jehovah means I am the Lord that heals you. It became a title for God. So I want you to think about this event. What was the purpose of this Mara event? So go back three days earlier. They've just come out of Egypt. They've seen God do the ten plagues. They've seen Egypt brought to their knees. And they've come out and they have been celebrating God's power. We're told that they... Miriam, Moses' sister, composed a song, and they sang, and they danced, and threw a party. They were positive. They were riding high. And three days later, they are negative without one positive thought. The roller coaster went from here to the very bottom in three days. Three days early, here's the point I want you to get. Not just as complex trauma cause you to have emotional roller coasters. It does. But three days earlier, if you were to interview the people coming out of slavery, here's what I think many would have said. They would have said, you know why we have so much pain? It's because of slavery. Now that we're out of slavery, our life is going to be good. We are going to be happy. Our life is going to be wonderful because slavery was our problem. How many of you have come out of addiction and said, addiction's my problem. As soon as I get sober, all my problems are going to go away. Everybody's going to love me. My partner's going to love me. All my problems are going to be fixed because drugs and alcohol are my problem. That's all I got to deal with. So what does God have to do with these people? He is, knows slavery isn't your problem. It's you that's your problem. It's how slavery changed you. So God knows that just because he took them out of Egypt doesn't mean that Egypt's out of them. And so they have to see that. And so how do you get a person who thinks they're healthy and that the external circumstances were the cause of their problems and they don't see their own unhealthiness? How do you get them to see it? You give them a bitter experience. Do you want to know what happens in bitter experiences? It exposes who we really are. Do you want to know what happens when everything is smooth? You can put on a mask and get away with it, and you can maintain that for a while. Oh, don't know what's happening here. My wife is playing with everything. Okay. 
Are you on top of that there, hun? Okay, there we go. We'll have a talk later. <laughs> no conflict. We'll just have a chat. Okay. Um, okay, do you remember what I was talking about? Or did you just get this squirrel, the squirrel happening here? Okay, back to what we're talking about. It's easy to believe lies about what you're really like when life is easy. You can think you're stronger than you are when life is easy. You can think you're more loving than you are when life is easy because nothing is challenging that. But when life is bitter and life is hard, it, does one or, it, does, it shows two different types of people. Bitter experiences expose bitter hearts. Bitter experiences in people who have their stuff healthy shows a healthy heart. Bitter experiences shows the deep truth about ourself. And so it's kind of interesting. God wants to show them that they have a bitter heart. So guess what he does? He creates a bitter experience. And as they go through that, they begin to realize, wow, look at how we reacted when we didn't get water like we thought we were going to get. We went negative, we lashed out in anger, we turned into these bitter people. Maybe we got a problem. Maybe we need a little bit of help. And that is the purpose of this event, is to put their true nature on display so they could see it for themselves. And that, sadly, is what most of us need. So we can go through... Life thinking we're great. And we can have an easy recovery. But then every once in a while, a really rough week hits us. And you feel like you regress. And you go, maybe I've never learned anything. No, you just saw the broken places in a clear way. Because of that bitter event. So here's what I want you to get. God doesn't just want his people free from slavery. He doesn't just want you free from addiction. He wants healthy people. He doesn't just want free people. He wants free people who are healthy. And that requires them finding out who they really are. But let me take it further. God knows that for you to be happy... You don't just need freedom from addiction, but you have to become healthy. But there's a third thing that he wants. Is he wants a relationship with them. What did the bitter experience do? It caused them to lash out at Moses. And who did he direct them to? God. And so what God is wanting, if we're going to be happy, is freedom from addiction, become healthy, have a relationship. You need all three. And that's what God is seeking to do. So I heard at a young age when I was going through a very tough time in my life that this bitter experience can make me bitter or better. And what happens in complex trauma? It makes you bitter. And now God says, let's take all of this and turn it into making us better. So let me just expand on that a little bit more. You notice how he ended it? He said, I am the God who heals you. Now, what had he just healed? He had just healed the water. Why didn't God say, I am the God that heals bitter water? Because the water was a metaphor of their heart. And what he was saying is, I healed the water, but I want you to see that I want to heal you. I want you to see that your heart is just as bitter as this water and if I can heal the water, I can heal you. And he wanted them to know up front that his commitment with them was not just to make them free, but to make them healthy. And that meant he wanted to heal them. He wanted to put them through circumstances that felt terrible, but would result in further healing. And so when you hit rough patches today, you can get really mad and frustrated. But look at it this way. It's God saying, let's go to the next level of learning and healing. 
this new experience is going to expose parts of you that are ugly, and I'm exposing it so I can heal it. I don't want this to become a bitter experience that leaves you bitter. I want it to be a bitter experience that makes you better. And that is the choice that we have. So let me just comment on this stick. I think there's two or three things that are important. Number one, I already mentioned, sometimes the things that you need to get healthy seem stupid. I don't know how many of you people have said to you, you should go and, and try this thing and go, ah, oh, it's stupid. And you're smarter than everybody, so you should know. And what you have to realize is that sometimes the things that seem stupid, there's something in them that brings healing. And we have to be open to that. Second thing, I think the stick is also saying God was going to do his part, but he required Moses to do his part. So that healing wasn't just a one-way thing where God said, sit on the operating table and I'll magically heal you and you'll get up and you'll be perfect. No, God says, you got to do your part. This isn't just me doing my part. you got to do your part. But there's a third thing. Do you realize that the problems of the Bible started with the tree in the Garden of Eden? And then in the New Testament, we are told that the solution to all of our problems is another tree, the one Jesus died on. And I think, and many people think, that all of these stories here with Israel, each one tells us a little bit that says Jesus is coming. He's the final solution. And so the stick, the tree that Moses threw in, God is saying there's going to be another tree that's going to be the solution to a lot of your problems. Final thing I want to say, and this isn't anything to do with the bitter water. I want you to go back and think about Israel coming through the Red Sea. Okay? So Israel comes through the Red Sea, and then God closes the sea. Guess what God was doing? Shutting off any opportunity to return to the old life. You know what many addicts would like? God, open the sea to get me out of addiction, but could you leave a tiny little path where I could get back if I need to? Do you want to know recovery has to be at some point? You purposely say, God, I'm closing all return routes. I'm not going back. Paraphernalia gone. Drug dealer phone numbers gone. All of that gone. Old friends. Boundaries. I find it interesting, if you want to go to another thing, God, the prophet Elijah was told to call the next prophet, Elisha. And Elisha was a farmer, and he was plowing the field with oxen. And God calls him through Elijah, and guess what Elisha does? He kills the oxen and uses the plow to create a fire to make a barbecue. And he is saying, I am closing all return routes to my old life. And so God is saying to Israel, you're through, out of slavery, I'm closing the Red Sea, no return route. Do you want to know what happened 11 months from now for them? They got a committee together and said, let's return to slavery. It's better than freedom. And you go, how would anybody think that? And I go, well, every addict I know has thought about that. And the thing that kept them going back was the, the Red Sea was closed. And so the more return routes you can close, the better.